you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Today I'd like to talk to you about the subject of being more in 2024. Being more in 2024. And let me give you the outline. It's in your bulletin if you want to follow along with us. Number one, be more of a servant. Be more of a servant. Number two, be more understanding. Be more understanding. Number three, be more of an example. Be more of an example. You know, we tend to make New Year's resolutions, and uh, I always make one resolution that I seem to not conquer. Usually it lasts about a month, and that is dieting and exercising. And so this year, I'm going to try to make two months. <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. I really am going to try my best to get down to my college weight. My college weight, which means I'll lose 32 pounds. But I won't tell you what my college weight is. All right? So y'all pray for me. I know it's funny, and, uh, but, you know, my doctor tells me, you know, my heart doctor, my lung doctor, they all tell me diet and lose weight. And I say, I tell them, I don't pay you all this money to criticize me. All right? <laughs> and it is a struggle. I'm telling you, it's a struggle. But uh, come January the 2nd, all that sugar is leaving my house. All right? I've had enough sugar in the last three weeks to kill a, a, yeah, a weak person. All right? So we're going to get that done. And that's the physical part. But I am sincere in what I'm fixing to say. We need to be concerned more about our spiritual being than any part. Yes, it would be better if I die and I lose weight. I would feel better. I know I'd feel better. But yet, the spiritual things in life are the most important things in life. And I have one resolution spiritually, and it is to be more like Jesus in 2024. I have fallen short many times this year. I have failed our Savior many times this year. And if you are honest with yourself, you are probably in that same boat. But I thank God for 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you will see this verse used in the text which we are about to read. And it is somewhat of a misunderstood text. A misunderstood. Jesus, you have to understand, was giving them his last example of who they needed to be in Christ Jesus. Because you have to understand that Jesus did his best to remind his disciples that he wasn't always going to be with them. But he would die, be laid in a tomb for three days, and he would rise again. The disciples really had a hard time accepting this. They still thought that Jesus would overthrow the Roman government and the Jewish leaders and rule in their place. In our text today, Jesus had enter, uh, entered Jerusalem on a Sunday, which we call Palm Sunday. Monday, he cleansed the temple of the money changers. Tuesday, Jesus clashed with religious leaders who wanted to arrest him. Wednesday was a day of rest. And on Thursday, Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room to observe the Passover. Jesus began by doing something that really surprised them. Let's look at this incredible scripture together as we look at 2024, a new year to serve our Lord and Savior. John chapter 13, verse 1, be more of a servant. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, three times earlier in the book of John, you will see Jesus telling the disciples 
that his time has not come yet. But here he is saying his time has come. It was Passion Week. It was a crazy week. He was about to be on on trial less than 24 hours. All this was showing that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And he is talking about the disciples. You have to understand, the disciples didn't always do what was right. Peter was the leader of the disciples. And sometimes Peter would engage his mouth before he would his brain. And this is going to be an instance of where he did that very same thing. Peter was the one earlier when he spoke up and Jesus first introduced the idea that he was going to have to die. And he was the one that says, hey, we're going to die for you. I'll die for you. I don't know about these other guys. But yet around the fire where the pressure of the world was on, he denied Christ three times. Folks, we've all failed this year. But the key is, it's like in boxing. You can be knocked down six times, but in boxing, if you get up the seventh time and knock that person out, you win. Folks, Satan is after us. Satan's not going to leave you alone. Satan is heightening his spiritual warfare. It's stronger than it's ever been in the world because I believe he knows his time is short. So if we're going to do something for God, I would pick 2024 if I were you. And I'm not predicting the end of the world, folks. I'm simply saying he could come very easily in the year 2024. So Jesus knew his time was about over. He knew these 12 men in the room And remember who was in there with them, Judas. And I've never understood this. How could a man be around Jesus for three years, see the miracles that he had done, and not want to be a Christian? That just boggles my mind. Because he saw who Jesus was. And folks, even here, he he, he gave Judas another time another chance to accept him as his Savior and Lord. Look in verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil already put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. There's no doubt in my mind. John chapter 6 clearly says, and Jesus told them he was not saved. He was not a Christian. Judas did not know the Lord. And the reason said, it says this here is because he'd already made a deal with, with the religious leaders. He told them, you give me 30 pieces of silver and I'll point out and I'll be eyewitness, I'll kiss Jesus on the cheek. So all this, Jesus knowing, look at verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from the supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. Folks, he shocked the disciples because this was not an act of someone in authority. Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus was King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus had done many miracles He was the superior of all these men. He was their boss. He was their leader. But yet, he did something and was starting to do something, and I guarantee you, uh, tongues were started waggling, and people were looking around the disciples like, what is he doing? You have to understand, this job was for a slave girl, not even a servant, okay? The for a slave, the lowest on the, on the ladder. And that's what he was doing. And it says, and after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel in which he was girded. Oh, folks, I am telling you, Jesus was telling them. Jesus was giving 
a true example of what a true servant of God does. Folks, Jesus came to serve. He has said that. He said that in Luke 19.10. He said, I came to serve and to seek those who are lost. So Jesus, in this intimate time, in this one of the last times he was with the disciples, was teaching them a lesson in life. See, our human nature is want to be served. We want people under us. We want people serving us. We want to give the orders and bark out the orders. We want to be numero uno. And I'm amazed at football teams. They won four games and they accidentally beat somebody good. They walk off the field and say they're number one. And I'm looking at them and say, y'all are terrible. Your record is terrible. You are not number one. But it's the world, folks. The world has taught us this. There is the world's way of doing things, and there's the spiritual way of God in Jesus doing things. Jesus was teaching his disciples the last lesson, be a servant to others. Mark chapter 9. Hold your finger there. Mark chapter 9. When I say... Keep your finger in nine. We're going to go there three times. Okay? We'll go to Mark three times. Mark 9.33. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it you were disputing of your, among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent. They didn't think Jesus was listening. They thought he was far enough away that they weren't hear, hearing the conversation. And I think it's another one of those in the room, they were looking around thinking, all right, who's going to say it? Who's going to tell Jesus what we were talking about? Folks, Jesus already knew what they were talking about. He was just putting them on the spot. And it says, but they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. Well, folks, I got news for you. Muhammad Ali is not the greatest of all times. God, Jehovah this bio, of this Bible, is the greatest of all times. Michael Jordan and, and you know, LeBron James are not the greatest of all times. It is God our Father. They are good at their sport. But I am just telling you, God is the King. And he sat them down and called the twelve and said to them, If anyone desires to be first... He shall be last of all and servant of all. See, we want to be first in a lot of things. We like to be first in line. I'm serious. What possesses people to go to a basketball game? It starts at 8 o'clock at night, and they're there at 8 p.m. the night before. Are you out of your mind? Why would you camp? in 20 degree weather with snow coming on the ground. You, you see what the world, we want to be one. We want to be the first ones in. And Jesus was telling them, listen folks, you're, you've got your eyes on the wrong goal here. All right? Everybody wants to be first. And Jesus said, if, you, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who has sent me. Have you noticed something about little children? One is Jesus loved the little children. Two is children are dependent upon their parents. All right, they don't make a living. They don't cook the food. They don't change the diapers. They don't do all these things. And it, this is what he was saying. You need to depend on me, not the world. You need to trust in me, not the world. And greatness in my books, I believe Jesus is saying, is service and ministry. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, 
You serve. You serve for God. You minister to people in Jesus' name. So he tells them right there, hey, if you want to be first, you got to be willing to be last. Be last. And you understand what true servanthood is. The other part of that is, have you noticed how trusting children are? They believe what their parents say. And they trust them that everything is going to be okay. Folks, our Heavenly Father, we can trust Him with every part of our lives. While we may not understand, we know God is our Heavenly Father and God is in control. So the first goal we need to have in our life is to be a servant. Not to serve, be a servant to others, not people serving us. The second thing he says is be more understanding. And here's where Peter gets involved. <laughs> Look at verse 6. And then he came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said, what I am doing you not, do not understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. All right? Think about what he's doing. He is, you know, chiding the Lord and Savior. He is saying, Jesus, you must, you must be making a mistake here. Peter was getting nervous. He was watching Jesus do the other disciples, and they were just being quiet. Nobody said a word. And when they got to Peter, he had all he could take. And he just said, listen, Jesus, I know you think you're right, but you're not right. You're not washing my feet. I'm not going to let you. And folks, we need to understand Jesus is always right. He had a point to make. And Peter was being stubborn. And part of his part of understanding, folks, is discernment. Knowing when to say something and knowing what to say. Folks, when you get saved, God places the Holy Spirit inside of you. And you would be doing yourself a great favor to always listen to the Holy Spirit. God the Father who created everything. Jesus the Son who died on the cross for our sins. And the Holy Spirit that guides us and leads us. He didn't have a problem with God and even Jesus, but the Holy Spirit was trying to talk to him, and Peter was just looking on the outside thinking, you're not washing my feet. I don't care what you say. I mean, that's literally what he was saying. Look what he says, and Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So Jesus is basically saying, if you want your way, yeah, I'll skip you, but you're going to be on your own on this issue. Folks, we don't need to be on our own on any issue in life. We need God 24-7, and if God tells us to do something, we would be smart to do it. Not try to explain away. Not try to make it logical. Sometimes, it's not that God's illogical. It's just that God works in the supernatural. We don't give God a chance to work in the supernatural because we've already got it figured out. Peter figured out, hey, this ain't going to change nothing. What is he doing? He's not going to wash my feet. I ought to be washing his feet, which is a true statement. But Jesus was trying to make a point to Peter, and look what he said. Simon Peter said, uh, Lord, do not own my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Peter says, if you're going to wash my feet, why don't you just get the whole body? All right? If you feel like doing that, you need to do that. And we think it's funny, but really it's sad that he would say this to our Lord and Savior. The problem is Jesus had already done that. When you ask Jesus Christ into your life, he cleanses you from head to foot. He washes you. He forgives you 
of your sin. We don't need, now again, separate this from a bath. We all need a bath. Okay, hopefully we take a bath a day, not just Saturdays, all right? But he's trying to tell him, Peter, you don't get it. I've already cleansed you. I've already forgiven you. I don't have to wash your whole body anymore. And Jesus said to him, and here's how he explained it. He who is bathed only needs to wash his feet, but is completely clean. He who has been saved doesn't need a full body washing. They've already had that. Folks, salvation is a one-time experience. But even in the Roman and Greek and the Jewish custom, in those days, the first thing you did before you went to a person's house, there was a basin right outside the deal. You washed your feet in that basin, or that person in that host would wash the feet for you before you went into their house. So that's what he's saying. He's saying, Peter, you've already done it, but you don't need a total body washing. You are completely clean, but notice what he says, but not all of you. Who was he speaking of? Look at verse 11. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. He was speaking of Judas. He was telling Judas. He was giving Judas, even though he had already talked to the authorities, even though he had already sold out Jesus, Jesus was thinking of him one more time. Time. Judas was in the room. It says the disciples, the twelve were there. Jesus washed Ju Judas' feet. So he wouldn't stick out, so he would understand that he loved him. He forgave him, even though Judas would not respond to Jesus' invitation. Jesus loved them to the end. And folks, we have to understand and in, 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 in our own lives, folks, we have to understand sometimes Satan is using uh, certain situations of life to trip us up. And we need to be able to recognize spiritual warfare. Folks, it's true. If you are living and breathing in a Christian, sometime during a day's time, Satan is going to come after you. And you need to be ready. You need to be able to recognize spiritual warfare. That's why the, the Bible tells us, you know, warfare, it's not person to person. That person that you think doesn't like you, that is not the problem. It is the spiritual side of things. We want to make things personal, and we should. Folks, the one thing that Jesus was teaching also in this is unity in the body of Christ. He wants unity. He wants us all to get along. He wants us all to depend on him. And he is teaching Peter what not to do. And he's given Judas another chance to do the right thing. But as we know, uh, Judas did not do the right thing. Look at Mark chapter 8. Mark 8. Mark 8. Verse 31. Mark 8, 31 says, Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and, he, and, he, uh, and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. That, that basically was the Sanhedrin of that day. And after three days, arise again. And he spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> Can you imagine him rebuking Jesus? That just blows my mind. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. It wasn't that Satan possessed him, but Satan influenced him. Folks, Satan wants to cause problems in churches. Satan wants to cause problems in families. Satan wants to cause problem in individuals. 
And we need to recognize Jesus was saying, Peter, you are being influenced by Satan. And it says, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And when he called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever dares to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. Folks, we have, he is literally talking about total surrender. This is what he wants in your Christian life. You giving God everything. Giving God your mind. You start with giving Him your heart. Giving Him your finances. Giving Him your relationships. Giving Him your words. Giving Him your thoughts. Oh folks, there's a battle in our minds. And it's going on every day. Verse 36, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Oh, folks, there are many a person in this world that has sold their soul and will spend the rest of their life with Satan in hell. They sold it. They said no. They rejected the calling of Jesus Christ in their life. For whoever is ashamed of me, in my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes to the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. Folks, another part says that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you in Matthew before my Father which is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father which is in heaven. So Jesus is trying to make him understand, Peter, it's not about you. It's not about you. Listen, folks, it's not about me. This is not my church. This is God's church. I'm just the shepherd. I'm the shepherd. I'm the chosen leader. And I want to do everything God wants us to do in 2024. <clears throat> folks, we need to be more of a servant. We need to be more understanding. And we need to pray for discernment in our lives. That we can discern what is of God and what is not of God. Peter failed Jesus several times. But God still loved Peter. And God used Peter mightily. On the day of Pentecost, he got up and preached, and 3,000 people were saved. Folks, it's never too late to do the right thing. It's never wrong to do the right thing. I pray in 2002 that we will be more understanding of God, of God, and of others. The third and final things, be more of an example. Look back in our text, John 13. So when he, verse 12, so when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you say it well, for so I am. Notice he's getting a little hint in there. Folks, words are cheap. Anybody can say they love Jesus. Anybody can say that they're a Christian, but there are two things that are a key that, to that, your attitude and your actions. Because your actions directly tie in with your attitude. And folks, we have way too much attitude going on in this world. I mean, people get mad about everything. When, I, when people cut me off and when people drive crazy and when People, I can't even see their license plate on the front of their car. They're so close to me. And my flesh wants to say, just hit the brakes. <laughs> my spirit says, you'll be there 45 minutes to an hour. <clears throat> be smart, folks. We are not supposed to be like the world. 138 times in the book of John, the world 
is used. That phrase, the world. And folks, the world is eating people up. The ways of the world are evil. The ways of the Lord, the world are secular. The, uh, they're sensual. They're ungodly. And we do not need to follow the world. We need to follow Jesus. Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. You say, well, for I am so. Then if your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you, all, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And there are religions that believe this was a command or a demand or uh, some people even say a suggestion to have feet washing uh, services. And I personally have never been led to do that. I'm not saying you can't. I, I haven't been a part of one. If, if you have and it worked for you, it's okay. It's okay. There's, I, I don't have a big issue with that. But here he is basically saying that we as Christians, need to help one another and help others. Our whole life should be about that. Let's take care of each other. And folks, we really do a good job of that. I love when I hear that Sunday school classes have taken food to someone who is sick. I love to hear when I hear things like Sunday school classes has got, gotten, you know, gifts uh, for needy children or food or uh, they have gone in, in Sunday school classes and fed. We have done real well in that. But sometimes God wants us to get out of the four walls of the church and get into our community and get our hands dirty. Folks, you have to understand foot water after you wash is dirty water. And most people go, and, and again, nowadays we just put gloves on. Just put gloves on. Get your gloves dirty for the Lord. And that's what he is saying. Verse 15, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. What was Jesus saying? You want to be like Jesus? Wash some feet. You say, literally? Hey, if God tells you to, do it literally. But what I'm thinking... He is saying is we're talking about service and we're talking about ministry. Help the hurting. Help the hungry. Give to help others. Most assuredly, verse 16, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you that do them. And I got to thinking about that last verse. That, or next to the last verse, the servant is not greater than his master, nor he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Do you realize, and I know you know this, Jesus came from heaven. Do you understand what Jesus gave up to come down here? He gave up a perfect life. He gave up a perfect place. He gave up a place where there was no sin. There was no hate. There was no death. There was no night. There was no... And look what He gave up for us. So would not logic tell you if Jesus would do that for us that we ought to do that for others? Folks, He gave His life for you if you're saved. He gave his blood for you if you were saved. He gave his body for you if you were saved. And again, I'm not saying we all need to be crucified on a cross. I'm saying surely we could find the time to minister and to serve others. Mark chapter 10. And I close with this. Mark 10, verse 35. Mark 10, 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. <laughs> A blank check. I'm thinking Jesus is thinking, oh no. It's not Peter this time. It, it, it's John and James. 
And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us that we may sit on your right hand and on your left in your glory. You, numero uno, but we want to be two and three on each side of you. I am holding my tongue right now. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. You know what I think he was talking about? Suffering and death. And oh, by the way, James was the first martyr in the New Testament. John lived a long life, but he was isolated on the island of Patmos. They said it to him, we are able. And I, I do think they were overthinking things. Okay, we always give ourselves more credit than we probably deserve. So Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism I'm baptized with you, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it is prepared. What was he saying? You're going to have to talk to God about this. <laughs> You're going to have to talk to God. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. And Jesus called them to himself and he said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. See, the Caesars of the world, the rulers of the world, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, they were the ones making the calls and ruling over people. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever you desire to be first shall be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus paid it all, folks. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but he has washed me white as snow. Folks, we need to be servants in 2024. Last night while I was looking at this scripture, the Holy Spirit just really spoke to me. And he said, Mike, you need to rededicate your life to Christ. So last night, beside my table there and in my chair, I bowed my heart and my eyes and I asked God to forgive me of my sins, to help me to be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit, help me to be more discerning to help me with my attitude and to roll up my sleeves and serve others. And before we even start our invitation, I want to do something different. Would you bow your heads and your eyes closed? Everyone just stay where you are first. If you're here today and you say, Brother Mike, I need to rededicate my life also. I need a new start in 2024. I need to be more of a servant for you. Don't look around, but would you just stand where you are? Just stand up where you are. Who is with me? Who says, this is what I need to do? People are still steady. People are still standing. Father, thank you for this day. God, I'm sorry for my sins. God, please forgive me. 
God, I give you my life. I recommit my life to you. God, I surrender my will to you. God, help me to be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. God, help me to think about others before I think even about myself. And God, help me to be the servant that you want me to be in 2024. God, help me to find a ministry, something hands-on that I can do for you. And God, I know you will bless that. God, I thank you for those who are making this commitment. God, I pray you bless them. And God, I pray for everyone. Lord, I'm not trying to exclude anyone. But God, I pray that you'd give us strength and wisdom and discernment and love and peace and joy in our hearts as we serve people in 2024. God, we love you. We thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for touching our hearts this day. And God, we will be changed. With your help, we will do more in 2024. God, we do it for your glory, for your honor. We do it in your name. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We'll air Everyone else stand up now. We're going to have our time of invitation, those helping us with the instruments. If there's any other decision that you need to make, you've been saved, and you need to come forward and let people know that you have been saved, would you come? You need to join this church. Surrender to a ministry or a mission. Whatever God has spoken to you, however God has spoken to you, would you come during our time of invitation?